first of all, thank you all for uh, for tuning in. It makes me feel a lot better. I know we started the the YouTube channel, but uh, I kind of feel like I'm talking to a wall if I don't have people here on the call. Uh, plus, there's there's commonly some good questions that kind of get get thrown in. So for today's uh, session, we are focusing on spirits and we're focusing on uh, whiskey and um, and agave spirits, um, really tequila and mezcal. I don't think we're going to talk much about uh, the the tertiary agave spirits or anything like Sotol or anything like that today. Uh, this is a robust session. So I hope that you plan for a little bit of extra time today. Um, I could see this easily taking about 45 minutes. Um, just because there's a ton to cover uh, when, it, when we talk about different styles of whiskey uh, around the world, number one, and then different styles of spirits that come from, uh, from Mexico that are agave based too. So we could stretch into a 45 minute, one hour long session today. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and just kick off. Uh, before we start talking about uh, these categories of spirits uh, individually, I think it's good to just have um, a basic knowledge of distillation uh, and sort of how that occurs. So uh, obviously we talk a lot about different wines, uh, which are a product of fermentation. In order to, uh, to have a spirit, you have to have basically a fermented beverage that is then distilled. <clears throat> So in the case of, uh, of alcohol, it distills at a, at a lower boiling point than water. Um, during your distillation, your vapors are separated from liquids via heat, and they're typically cooled and liquefied into potable spirits, um, keeping in mind uh, to discard the four shots and the tails uh, for toxicity and lack of flavor, respectively. Two basic styles of, of stills. Um, that function pretty differently are the pot still, um, which we'll show you a diagram here in a second, and the continuous still. Continuous, also known as the coffee or the calm still, has two tanks. One is an analyzer, the other one's known as a rectifier. And you can see a, a basic diagram here. A <clears throat> little bit um, fuzzy, and I apologize for that once I, I expanded the picture. Uh, but you can see here, uh, heat is utilized in the kettle. Uh, your vapors will come off from the head, they'll escape into the heat exchanger. Uh, you add cold water to get your distilled spirit, and your hot water uh, goes to waste. Uh, in the continuous still, there's a lot more going on. You can see um, the analyzer here on the left and the rectifier here on the right. Um, your wash goes in here into the rectifier, um, to which point uh, you will have uh, steam added over here on the analyzer you'll get uh, liquid coming out. Um, you'll get alcohol vapor that comes out here, back into the rectifier. Um, you'll get sort of your, your less volatile components are recycled back into the analyzer. Uh, your really volatile stuff is completely spit out uh, and then your spirit comes out here. It's a much cleaner style of spirit production. So what you'll typically find is that um, spirits with more congeners, uh, which can add more flavor. Uh, we'll utilize pot stills, so a lot more whiskey-based production here. Um, more of your clean style of spirits, more vodka kind of driven you'd see coming out of the continuous or coffee still. Um, there are obviously always uh, ex uh, exceptions to these rules, right? Uh, I think Grey Goose still utilizes a pot still. Uh, I'm sure you can find other cleaner styles of spirits that go through continuous still too. <coughs> Oh, the old Tommy Cooper whiskey quote, I'm on a whiskey diet, I've lost three days already. Fantastic. Uh, so what we're gonna focus on with the whiskey lesson is what is whiskey? Uh, what is the difference between spelling whiskey with an E and not? Uh, American whiskey, Scotch whiskey, blended whiskey, Irish whiskey, and then other world whiskeys. So it's a ton to cover. Um, there's a lot of different slides in here that might be uh, producer uh, driven that I'll probably skim over uh, and let you all uh, review on your own uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. So what is whiskey? Uh, whiskey is a liquor or spirit distilled from a fermented grain mash and aged in wood, typically oak. Um, it's strictly regula regulated spirit worldwide and it has many classes and types uh, and it's produced all over the world. So whiskey with an E versus whiskey without it kind of goes by several different names, which can indicate the style, right? Uh, 
Um, you know that bourbon is going to be a certain style, scotch is a certain style, Irish, uh, and then Canadian whiskey as well. Uh, the origin is your first indication that helps you uh, understand the style of the whiskey. Um, each place sort of has its own set of rules and regulations regarding the making of their specific whiskeys. So what types of grains can be utilized, the production methods, and the length of the maturation. And then spelling differentiations, um, this is very generic, but whiskey without an E is typically in uh, Scotch, uh, Welsh, Canadian, and Japanese countries. Uh, whiskey with an E, you'd find more commonly in Ireland and the United States. There are, again, exceptions to that rule. I think Maker's Mark is an important one to note that leaves the E off um, domestically here for sure. As far as production process um, in the United States, American whiskey production process kind of goes as follows. Uh, we start with mashing. Uh, here the grains are placed in a hammer mill and ground into a fine flour. Uh, it's then placed into a mash cooker with iron-free water and cooked for about 30 minutes, which kicks off fermentation, our next step. Uh, the mash is transferred to a fermentation vat and yeast is added. Uh, the process converts the alcohol, excuse me, converts the alcohol carbon dioxide over about a three-day period, and your end result is called a wort, W-O-R-T. Now there's two types of mash. Uh, there's a sweet mash. Uh, or a yeast mash in which the grains are fermented into wort by adding all fresh yeast. And then there's the sour mash, uh, which is fermentation that started by using leftover wort mash from a previous mash batch, similar to making kind of like a sourdough bread. Um, and you'll find this uh, in several uh, famous pr producers. Uh, then we go to distillation. The wort's distilled uh, at least twice, um, typically to remove impurities. Uh, and the final product is now called New Spirit or White Dog. And some people will go straight to market with White Dog as well. Uh, the first distillation is through the column still typically, and the second is through a doubler or pot still. Um, some whiskeys will undergo unique filtration processes, and we're gonna talk about that uh, here in just a few minutes. Um, and then you get to, to maturation. And this is where the resulting spirit is placed in oak and mature. Uh, a large part of the flavors and characteristics of whiskey come from this maturation in oak, uh, whether it's done in uh, new American oak or finished in all sorts of different uh, barrel vessels. Um, the degree of these notes really kind of depends on the length of the time that it spends in barrel too. Uh, your common aromatics that you get from oak barrels, of course, just like in wine, vanilla, caramel. Uh, here you might see a little bit more smoke because of the heavier intensity of the char too. Um, three basic types of whiskey produced in the USA. There's straight whiskey, uh, which is extremely strictly regulated. It has to be 51% of a single grain, whether it's corn, rye, or wheat. It's got to be aged for two years and new charred white oak barrels. It has to be at least 80 proof and nothing other than water uh, can be utilized to bring it to the bottling proof. You have blended whiskey, which um, is a little more loosely regulated. It has to be made with 20% straight whiskey. The other 80% may contain, you know, neutral grain spirits, flavorings, colorings, things like that. Uh, and then light whiskey, which is extremely loosely regulated. It just has to be produced in the U.S. and stored in used or uncharred white oak containers. So some great examples of straight whiskey um, from a categorical standpoint. Um, you'll find bourbon, um, Tennessee whiskey, rye whiskey, corn whiskey, and wheat whiskey. And there's good examples of producers here for each one of them, of course. Knob Creek, pretty famous for bourbon. Jack Daniels and, and Dickel, really the only couple of people in Tennessee making Tennessee whiskey. Um, Bullet, fantastic for rye. Hudson uh, for corn whiskey. And Barenheim, if you're not familiar, for wheat whiskey is super cool. Um, so what makes a straight whiskey into a bourbon per se? Well, all bourbon is first classified as straight whiskey. And then in order to use the designation bourbon, the distillery must adhere to the following restrictions. It's got to be 51% corn. It's got to be matured in new charred American oak barrels for two years, right? That American white oak barrels have sort of a high level of natural oils in the wood that would give their whiskeys more of those woody vanilla flavors. No flavorings or, or colorings added to straight bourbon whiskey. And, you know, a majority of it is now is, is left being produced in Kentucky, although today you can produce it anywhere in the United States. Uh, a few more examples, Maker's Mark, Woodford Reserve, there's dozens more that we can talk about. 
Another style of, of straight whiskey uh, that we talked about is Tennessee whiskey. Um, this is one of the more unique uh, styles out there. It can only be produced in the state of Tennessee. Um, really, just, I, I mentioned Jack Daniels and Dickel. Uh, there's only a handful of distilleries there. It's got to be 51% of, of one grain. Um, it doesn't have to be corn, although it typically is. And then it has to be filtered through charcoal uh, once it's been distilled. And so this process typically takes about 10 days and it's known as the Lincoln County process. And I will tell you that of all the, the, the whiskeys in the United States, um, if you're out of stock on Jack Daniels or Dickel, and that's what somebody likes to drink all the time, uh, you're not gonna find something else that uh, is similar to it. Uh, it's one of the more unique uh, processes out there. Um, other styles of American whiskeys that you'll find, small batch, uh, which comes from a, a batch of barrels that have been mixed prior to the bottling. Um, some good examples here would be Baker's, Booker's, Maker's Mark, Knob Creek, and Woodford Reserve. And then single barrel, and a great, great example of that would be uh, Bland's. <clears throat> I'm not going to walk you through um, everything on these slides. I'm going to let you all look at them individually on your own because there's a lot of detailed information that uh, isn't necessarily um, extremely important, but I think it is important to talk about Colonel Blanton's family. Um, and the famous Warehouse H, where this is produced in uh, the Buffalo Trace Distillery. Uh, other premium American whiskeys you can find, Woodford Reserve, uh, Basil Hayden. And I think with Basil Hayden, uh, it's unique to know that, you know, he, he put together the, the blending of rye along with corn um, in his distillery standard bourbon um, to sort of balance out the sweetness of what the corn was uh, and to a great, great amount of success. And so. Um, they've been producing whiskey for over a couple of hundred years now. Uh, it's still a small batch and um, it's actually priced quite nicely considering what it is. Uh, Buffalo Trace, again, um, this is the distillery too and it's right on the banks of the Kentucky River. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, they've been producing their whiskeys in the same way for a couple of hundred years. Uh, other premiums, Whistle Pig, and this is from, you know, unfortunately Dave Pickerel I think passed away recently. Um, but sort of like finishing their, uh, their whiskeys in different styles of casks, uh, where you see here he was using Madeira, Sauterne, Port, Cognac, and Sherry. Those are things that you typically see reserved for Scotch production. Uh, he started utilizing it in Whistle Pig, and their, their blend, the 12-year Old World, uh, is a blend of those that actually gets uh, pretty high critical acclaim. Uh, moving away from the United States, Irish whiskey, um, is a, a massive category, right? And probably about 70% of that category is owned by Jameson, which is produced at the Middleton Distillery. Um, so we can, we can go through sort of the differences in what Irish whiskey is compared to Scotch whiskey and uh, American whiskey. Uh, most Irish uh, pot still whiskey is distilled three times, right? While most Scotch is only distilled twice. Um, peat is pretty rarely used in the malting process. I think there's only a handful. I know, um, man, was it Canamara, I believe, is the name of the, the Irish whiskey that's peated. There's a couple others, I'm sure. And then you find there's a Canadian one out there, too, that I'm, I'm blanking on right now. Those are always fun to look up, but those are the exceptions and not the rule, right? Uh, so typically, your Irish whiskeys have a little bit of a smoother finish. Um, as opposed to what you see from that smoky peat and scotch. Um, it was once, you know, the most popular spirit in the world. You know, a long period of decline from the late 19th century onward really damaged the industry. And although Scotland sustains about 105 distilleries, Ireland has only like seven in uh, current operation. Four have been doing it for a long time. Um, and then, you know, only one of which was operating before 1975. Irish whiskey has seen a great resurgence and popularity since the late 20th century. And it's been really one of the fastest growing spirit categories in the world every year since 1990. Uh, so you're starting to see a big expansion of distilleries and we'll look at that here. But I think it's important to note um, sort of where they are. Um, and you'll find Bush Mills is probably one of the more important ones up here in the Northeastern part of Ireland. Cooley here in Louth, uh, Tullamardew here in Offaly. And then probably the most important area though, I think is Cork down here and the Irish distillers that produce Middleton, Jameson, Powers, and a handful of others. That's a cool little map for sure. We mentioned Jameson being a huge part of the category. 
Um, you know, it's, it's owned by Pernod Ricard. I think that's important. Uh, we mentioned it coming from down there in Cork. Um, in 2013, the annual sales topped 4.7 million cases. That's 56 million bottles of Jameson Irish whiskey. That's insane, right? Uh, by far the best selling Irish whiskey in the world. Uh, the United States is the largest market for, for Jameson with its consumption up uh, in 2013 by 12%. Uh, for the premium side, a uh, little further aged, I always loved Redbreast. It's made at that same distillery there. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the tasting notes and things for you. You can take a look. Bushmills, um, of course, this is their 16 year single malt. Um, I think the licensed distill in the area was granted to Sir Thomas Phillips in 1608 by King James I. It's critical. And the 1608 date is actually printed on the labels of Bushmills rated whiskey. So it uses water drawn from St. Collins Rill, which is a tributary of the River Bush, uh, which gives it its name, uh, Bushmill. Um, Scotch whiskey. So here, of course, we have quite a few more categories, and it can be a little bit convoluted. So um, it's an internationally protected uh, name. So you can only utilize Scotch on a whiskey that's made in the country of Scotland, right? Cannot be made anywhere else in the world. Um, so the major differences between scotch and other whiskeys of the production method, the use of peat. Um, peat is basically coal in its primary stage. And I think we can distill this down, uh, pardon the pun, and talk about why peat is utilized in Scotland. Uh, it's prevalent, it's everywhere in the marshlands and in certain areas that are outlying, right? We think about the islands and the places that aren't in the center of the country. They had a more difficult time getting lumber shipped to their areas where they were producing um, producing spirits. And so they had to utilize what they had to work with, and that's peat. And I think that's why you see in places like Isla and Orkney a heavier dose of peat influence on the spirit itself. Um, also the maturation, uh, how long its spirit spins in the cask or barrel, and really what those casks or barrels are uh, have been used for previously. <clears throat> Uh, those few factors are the primary foundation for the distinctive flavor profiles that we find in Scotch. <clears throat> Major wheat regions of Scotland for production of Scotch whiskey are uh, Speyside, right up here. This is your most important category and easily the largest um, for, from a sales standpoint. The Highlands here, down in the Lowlands, um, and then you have Isla, just off the coast. And then what we call the islands, which incorporates Sky and Orkney and Mull uh, and a few others. Speyside, again, you know, probably the most important region. Uh, here's a fantastic map of all of the different distilleries that you'll find throughout the River Spey. And you can see it right here, cutting through. Everyone's right on the edge, basically, right? Um, and then, always fun to note, right over here is the Loch Ness, right? So over half of Scotland's malt and whiskey distilleries can be found within this one little region. Lush, fertile valley of the River Spey is undoubtedly the heart of single malt whiskey distilling in Scotland. Um, classically, you'll find flavors of honey and vanilla and then fresh fruits. You see a little more delicate style here. Um, with age, especially when matured in sherry casks, they evolved to deliver like dried fruit, sweet spice flavors. Um, easily the two best selling single malt whiskeys uh, in the world, the Glen Levitt and the Glen Fittick come from the Speyside. Um, Speyside whiskeys can generally be classified as light, grassy, uh, or rich and sweet, too, um, in the situation of Macallan, right? Um, so here you'll find the Macallan, the Glen Levitt, Glen Farkless, Aberlour, um, Glen Rolf, and then Balvini, which is famous for their, uh, their different barrel finishes that I'm actually quite a fan of. Uh, the Highlands here, you, you find um, probably a bit smoother stylistically, known as one of the most scenic regions in all of Scotland. Uh, rugged peaks and heather covered moorland is geographically the largest of the whiskey producing regions. Uh, covers three major areas and a variety of warm, rounded single malt whiskeys. The West Coast uh, has more maritime influence um, on its malts, such as Oban. Uh, the Central Highlands, uh, which is a lot more heather and honey kind of notes to it. Um, has some of the highest distilleries like Dalhwini. And then um, Speyside and its Golden Triangle of distilleries, uh, the distilleries here that malt whiskeys are considered to sit within a region of their own. Uh, Scotland's largest whiskey region boasts a dizzying array of styles from like rich and textured, you get some more fragrantly floral, um, and it's really befitting of the ever-changing landscape there. 
Uh, even without the, the space side fame that you see, some of the most famous names are here, and that's Dalmore, Glenn Goyne, and Oban. Uh, the lightlands, the, excuse me, the lowlands, you'll find a, a little bit lighter, and I find the oil content, um, oiliness characteristic of a lowlands uh, scotch whiskey can be a little bit more. Uh, the terrain is, you know, characterized here by rolling fields, which are ideally suited for growing grain for whiskey. Uh, so the softer landscape is mirrored in the region's single malts, which tend to be lighter in both color and body than what you see in, in the highlands. Little or no peat utilized in the drying of the malts. The whiskeys here are generally fresh light, fragrant, floral with more cereal flavorings to them. Uh, the region's now only got four currently producing distilleries, Elisa Bay and near Vaughan, which is owned by William Grandsons, uh, Glen Kinchy uh, near Edinburgh, uh, Auchentoshan near Clydebank, and Bladnock in Galloway. Uh, two new distilleries, Daft Mill and Fief and Annandale and Borders have started distilling but have not yet brought anything to the market yet. Uh, the islands, uh, we'll start with Isla and Sky. Um, are, these are peaty and maritime, right? So we talked about uh, peat sort of being their source for, for fuel, for uh, producing spirits. Um, sitting amongst the inner Hebridean Skylish Isles, um, the malt whiskey producing islands of Isla and Sky, rugged, windswept, barren. The island landscapes generally produce single malt whiskeys that are peaty, maritime, and rich. Um, it's, uh, and it, I, I would always explain it as sort of uh, a car exploding in front of your face, right? <laughs> so, uh, so you get like uh, burnt rubber and paint thinner and, uh, and sort of like gasoline uh, notes to it on the nose. It doesn't necessarily sound super appealing, but people that love, uh, love Talisker, love Lagavulin, uh, love Laphroaig, uh, they drink those whiskeys for a reason, right? They're powerful. Um, that's pretty much it for whiskey. So I think we did a good job of cruising through that. Does anybody have questions regarding whiskey before we move into tequila and mezcal? Fire them away. Okay. So with tequila, um, you know, this is really, uh, we're going to take a look at farming production and then the laws, um, that Mexico implements here. Uh, by Mexican law, tequila can only be produced in the state of, uh, of Jalisco. Uh, in limited munis municipalities in other states, though, Guanajuato, Michoacan, Nayarit, and Tamaulipas. And you can see all of those on the, the map here. Thank you, Society of Wine Educators. We're going we're gonna to show a map of mezcal uh, uh, producing regions later on as well. And you'll notice that a couple of these overlap, which I think is uh, always an interesting thing to take a look at. Quick question, are there any significant differences in the production of Japanese and Canadian whiskeys? Yeah, I think uh, we probably should spend a little bit more time on that. This is really focused on uh, US, Ireland, and Scotch, but for sure you see uh, fantastic single malts coming out of Japan. Uh, and then Canadian whiskeys, uh, there are single malts. There's actually a peated Canadian whiskey that I found recently. Uh, and you know a lot more of a focus on on blends. So from the difference standpoint, the Japanese are following through with the Scottish um, style of single malt whiskeys, whereas the Canadians are driving more towards blended styles. Good question. Uh, when we talk about tequila, we obviously need to focus on blue agave. So by Mexican law, blue agave is the only plant that's utilized for the production of tequila. Um, Blue agave grows long, fibrous, lanceolate leaves of a bluish color whose usable part in the manufacture of tequila is the heart or the head, um, or basically the pina, right? Uh, the red volcanic soil in the surrounding regions particularly well suited to, to growing blue agave. That's part of the lily family, and it typically takes seven to nine years for an agave to mature uh, the pina. Some would argue that that number should be more 12 to 15, realistically. Uh, but the demand for tequila has changed that mindset. Uh, we're seeing less mature plants today. Uh, agave tequila grows differently depending on the region, extremely differently. It's a terroir style, uh, or uh, it's the concept of terroir in spirit here. Um, blue agave is grown in the highlands regions are typically larger and sweeter in aroma and taste. Uh, agave's Harvested in the lowlands, on the other hand, typically a bit more herbaceous and fragrant in flavor. 
more than 300 million of these plants are harvested each year. And so that's starting to put a real strain when it comes to supply and demand uh, for blue agave spirits, because the supply, well, if we keep up with this demand, eventually it's going to run out. Different types of tequila, it's classified uh, one of the following two categories based on the percentage of a natural agave sugars used in its production. So you have 100% agave and then you have tequila. So 100% agave is a product whose fermentation may not be enhanced with sugars other than those obtained um, from the blue agave grown in the territory specified in the declaration. For the product to be considered 100% agave tequila, it must be bottled in the bottling plant controlled by the authorized producer, which must be located within the territory specified, right? So you'll see 100% de agave, puro de agave, um, uh, all of these different words that can be on the label. It's sort of like uh, bottled in bond and when it comes to American whiskey, category that we probably should have talked about, but that's something that requires a bonded warehouse, um, a minimum amount of alcohol content, in the case of bottled in bond, 100, 100 proof. Um, and a few other things that you need to pay attention to. And then you have tequila, right? So to be labeled tequila, it may be enhanced and blended together prior to fermentation with other sugars in proportion not to exceed 49% of the total reducing sugars expressed in units of mass. So a little bit uh, confusing, but really uh, we need to pay attention to the fact that it's gotta be 51% uh, agave, essentially. So, Production of tequila uh, is actually rather unique because we're taking the heart of, uh, of the pina and transforming it into an alcohol, right? So the stages in the tequila making process during which the raw materials undergo chemical, biochemical, and physical changes until a specific product is obtained in each stage. So the process includes the following basic stages, among others, so harvest or the hema, and you might notice hema. Um, the El Jimador is the person that uh, harvests the piña. His tool is called a COA, C-O-A. That's a question that's kind of bounced around a little bit. Um, and he uses it to cut off the leaves and get to the center of that heart called the piña. Then you have hydrolysis, extraction, formulation, fermentation, distillation, uh, aging, and filtration and bottling. So it's quite, uh, quite a lot. Here you can see the Himador here using his koa, trimming off those leaves. For those of you that ever get the opportunity to go um, to Mexico, um, I've been to Guadalajara to harvest piña and it is a very labor intensive job just to get one done. And we talk about 300 million of these plants being harvested annually. You gotta cut off all these leaves and then get to the center of this thing. It's impressive. And then, you know, once you get to it, you get about 15 pounds of the agave piña here at the center of it and that'll help to produce one liter of tequila. Pretty wild. So we talked about hydrolysis in the next stage. Uh, this is cooking, right? And so during this step, um, this is where a lot of different people have more traditional brick ovens. Um, some people will utilize steam injection, which uh, is definitely a new method that has some, uh, some people thinking that it's not proper production method. Uh, or you can see stainless steel autoclaves as well. Um, and, and what this does is it activates a chemical process within the pina that converts their complex carbohydrates into simple fermentable sugars. So it softens the pina and makes the, the process of sugar extraction quite a bit easier. That extraction occurs um, in traditional methods. It'll occur with what we call a tahona, uh, which is this cooked pina being mashed by a large stone wheel. Uh, traditionally, it was pulled by a donkey. Uh, today you see obviously more modern distilleries using mechanical crushers to separate the fiber from the juices. And so if you're a tequila purist and you want to be uh, as traditional as humanly possible, you'll want to see the donkey and the tahona. Uh, if you're more on the, you know, the supply being met by the demand, uh, you'll probably want to see a bit more modern style of, of production. After all of that, then we finally get to fermentation, right? So during the fermentation process, these sugars are converted to alcohol uh, within, in large wooden vats or stainless steel tanks. Um, here you can use yeast to add to accelerate or, and control the fermentation. Traditionally though, the yeast grows naturally on the agave leaves it's used. 
Right? So you're seeing a lot more wild yeast uh, in distilleries. Uh, typically, this will take seven to 12 days, depending on, on native versus cultured yeast. Distillation then follows. Uh, this is really sort of the fifth step, right, in creating tequila. Uh, and here, the ferments are separated by heat and steam pressure within the stainless steel pots um, or distillation towers we showed earlier. While some tequilas are distilled three times, the majority are only distilled twice. Uh, the first distillation is also known um, as smashing. It takes a couple hours and yields a liquid with an alcohol of about 20%. <clears throat> and this is just ordinario, right? The second is called rectification. And this takes three or four hours and yields a, a much higher alcohol towards 55%. And after that second distillation, you can consider it Blanco tequila, right? So this is the first real category of tequila, Blanco. Or you can bottle there and finish it up, or you can choose to mellow it in oak, right? And so like we do with bourbon and whiskeys around the world, to soften the flavor of tequila through the addition of one or more of the following ingredients, um, you will see occasionally, and maybe not always traditionally, but uh, the addition of caramel uh, coloring, natural or oak extract, glycerin, and sugar-based syrups can be added. Um, aging then, uh, almost all containers used for tequila aging are French or American white oak barrels that have previously been utilized to age bourbon or, or whiskey. Uh, reposados are aged between two and 12 months. Uh, yehos are between one and three years, and extra añejos are for longer than three years. So the longer that tequila ages, the more color and tannin it's gonna extract from those oak barrels. And then of course, the condition of the barrels, um, such as their age, the previous use, whether or not they've been toasted or burned, will also affect the final product. Uh, then you go to, to bottling. So just like, um, you know, some of these other things like champagne, right? Tequila is assigned an appellation of origin status, which limits the production to those five Mexican states that we talked about earlier. <coughs> Jalisco, of course, the center of uh, tequila production. It's the only state that as a whole has the status of the AO. Um, it's considered the place where tequila was first made and where the standards are defined. The other states are, are only permitted to grow blue agave in small and defined little areas. And so uh, really focusing on Jalisco uh, as, as the center of production. Uh, your different classes of tequila, <clears throat> you start really with, uh, with silver, right? Or Blanco or Plata. Uh, this is uh, a product whose commercial alcohol content must be adjusted by dilution with water. Uh, water only, right? This is tequila at its most pure and simple state. And typically when visiting a distillery, you start with Blanco and uh, look, if the Blanco is not good, then the Añejo and the Reposado certainly aren't going to be either, right? Um, this, uh, at this point from direct from the stills, when a tequila is obviously fresh and true to the nose and the taste, so resting or aging a poor Blanco may improve its taste, but a Blanco may also truly lose its charm when made into a Reposado or Añejo. Then you find uh, Hoven, Oro, or Gold, and this is a product that can be enhanced by mellowing, right? So by adding, um, you know, simple syrup, uh, sugars um, or caramel coloring or other things like that. Some of this is done to take the edge off an unaged tequila. It's less expensive than resting the tequila in wooden barrels, and it's most commonly done with mixto styles. So people like Corvo Gold or Salsa Gold. Uh, then you start to get into sort of the more serious ones, Reposado, which is rested or aged. Um, and so you can enhance this by mellowing, and then you have the aging process of at least two months in direct contact with wood of oak um, and up to a year, right? It could be, a well, as long as 11 months. Uh, a year longer would be then considered a Añejo. I think it's 364 days is technically the... Uh, process, but it's typically not aged for more than six months when it comes to Reposado. Uh, then you have Añejo and Extra or Extra Aged. Uh, this is the one that is at least one year of oak aging up to three years. Uh, and it has to be in containers with a maximum capacity of 600 liters. Um, it can be adjusted by the dilution of water. Um, and of course, it can be enhanced as well by mellowing. The resulting, uh, the result of blending extra aged tequila with ultra aged tequila is considered uh, extra aged, right? So you can backtrack off of ultra aged to get into extra aged, so sort of declassifying down. And then you have your ultra aged, so um, can't be enhanced by mellowing. Guy has to be aged for at least three years, 
um, without specifying the aging time on the label though. Uh, it has to be maximum capacity of 600 liters again and only diluted by water. Um, so that's te tequila as a whole. Next, we're gonna talk about mezcal. Um, you can see here the different production areas for all of the agave spirits. Up here in Chihuahua, you'll find Sotol, and in Sonora, you'll find Bacanora. <clears throat> I know uh, Wanda was asking a question about different ones that you've seen on Wine Study Pals a couple of weeks ago. I'd be curious to, to follow that and see what different um, producers people have found in these tertiary agaves. You'll find here, too, uh, tequila production in uh, Jalisco, Michoacan, Tamaulipas, Guanajuato, and Nayarit that we mentioned before. You'll see Guanajuato and Tamaulipas over here for mezcal production as well. But really, Oaxaca is your, uh, your main region for production of mezcal. Um, so this is a distilled alcoholic beverage made from any type of agave plant native to Mexico, right? The word mezcal um, it comes, means basically oven cooked agave, essentially. Uh, agave grows in many parts of Mexico. The most mezcal itself is produced in Oaxaca, as we mentioned. It can also be produced in these other, uh, other states, too. So it's unclear whether distilled drinks were produced in Mexico before the Spanish conquest. <coughs> Excuse me. The Spaniards were introduced to native fermented drinks such as pulque, which is also made from agave. And then they began experimenting with the agave plant to find a way to make a distillable fermented mash. And the result here was mezcal. So agave was really one of the most sacred plants in pre-Spanish Mexico and had a privileged position in religious rituals, mythology, and economy. So the cooking of the piña or the heart of the agave and fermenting its juice was practiced. The origin of this drink has a little bit of a myth it said that lightning bolt basically struck an agave plant, cooking and opening it, releasing its juice. And for this reason, the liquid is called uh, the elixir of the gods. Uh, however, it's not certain whether native peoples of Mexico had any distilled uh, liquors prior to the Spanish conquest. So upon introduction, these liquors were called aguardiente, literally fire water or fiery water. The Spanish had known distillation processes since the eighth century and had been used to drinking hard liquor. They brought a supply with them from Europe, but when this ran out, they began to look for a substitute. And they've been introduced to pulque and other drinks based on the agave and agave plant. So this is where they start to, uh, to experiment um, with production of mezcal. Uh, and then here on the right, you'll find Mejuel, the goddess of agave, which is pretty cool. So pulque is, is uh, basically a milk colored viscous liquid that produces a light foam. It's made by fermenting the sap of certain types of maguey plants. In contrast, mezcal is made from the heart, uh, the cooked heart of certain agave plants. Um, when we talk about tequila versus mezcal, of course, tequila can be produced only from that blue agave. Mezcal is made from like 30 different agave species. Um, you'll find certain ones that have uh, terroir indications on their bottlings. <coughs> uh, Del Maguey is famous for that. You also find different mezcals that will uh, list what agave species they're utilizing. So there are seven super notable uh, agave species that are utilized for mezcal. Uh, <clears throat> there's no real exhaustive li list, uh, but you know the regulations allow basically any agave, provided they're not used as prim primary material and other governmental DO stuff. Notably, this means that mezcal cannot be made from blue agave, right? So typically mezcal is handcrafted by smaller scale producers. Uh, I mean, a village can contain dozens of production houses called uh, fabricas or palenques, each using methods that have been passed down over for over hundreds of years, possibly. Here it begins with the harvesting of the plants, uh, which can weigh up to 88 pounds each, uh, extracting the piña by cutting off the leaves and roots, just like we do with, uh, with tequila production. They're then cooked for a few days, often in pit ovens, uh, which are usually earthen mounds over pits of hot rocks. The underground roasting actually gives mezcal its intense and distinctive smoky flavor. They're then typically crushed and mashed by the tahona and left to ferment in large vats or barrels with a little bit of added water. Uh, the mash is allowed to ferment the resulting liquid and distilled uh, is distilled in either clay or copper pots, uh, which will help modify the flavor in the final product. Uh, the distilled product is then bottled and sold. So unaged mezcal is referred to as joven, right? Some of the distilled products left to age in barrels for a month 
uh, between one month and four years, uh, but some could be aged for as long as 12 years, wow, which is pretty interesting. So mezcal, you can typically find alcohols of up to 55%, um, just like tequila, it's most commonly distilled twice. First distillation known as the punta and comes out at about 75%, and then it can be distilled a second time, uh, excuse me, 75 proof, can be distilled a second time to help raise that alcohol content. Harvesting, just like we saw with the El Jimador. Um, here's the guy harvesting in Oaxaca. And you can see him cutting off all those leaves and trying to get to the heart of that pina. And then the cooking process, you know, as we said, typically these earthen mounds, as opposed to the, the big upright clay ovens that you'll see with tequila. Here's the Tejona. We mentioned uh, traditional uh, being utilized by a donkey. Uh, here's sort of the more modern take on it. And that's basically it with production on spirits. There are a few other things that I think are important to, um, to take a look at. This is a, a good 30,000 foot flyover. Um, I think it's also important to know different aging classes when it comes to mezcal, uh, different producers, uh, as with any of these things. But that's a big, big uh, presentation to give. And I think it was good that we got through it in, uh, in just 45 minutes. So let's take a look at next week real quick. Next week is South America. Fantastic. That'll be reasonably quick. Uh, we'll talk about Chile, Argentina, uh, Uruguay, uh, Peru, um, some stuff in Bolivia and Brazil too. Um, a lot of the regulations, but uh, I don't think this will be nearly the 45 minute presentation that we just had on spirits. Yeah. Awesome. Any, uh, any other questions from anybody before we call it a day? Rad. Thanks gang. Appreciate you showing up. I'll post the link to the YouTube video uh, and send out the PowerPoint slides uh, this afternoon. Have a happy Sunday.